The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, Almighty God, the unfolding tale of our country. There was a vision pulling them forward to advance the Christian faith in this new world. And the prayer that built a nation. They said, we have come here for the advancement of the Christian faith. Plus, a fiery wreck. More in this room in our lives is stuck. And one teen clings to life. He said, your son won't live through the night. We kick off our week of prayer. Something just came over me, said, guys, I'm going to pray. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks. The Interior Department some years ago put up a plaque that said, Act One, Scene One of the unfolding drama that became the United States of America. April the 29th, we celebrate as the founding of this great nation hundreds of years ago. And today we begin our annual week of prayer. You'll see amazing stories of healings and miracles. And we invite you to pray along with us. Later on this program, we'll look back at a prayer from the year 1607 and see how that prayer shaped the nation that we know as the United States of America. But first in the news, a gunman attacks a synagogue in California, and the, well, the, congreg the congregants of that synagogue fought back. One woman threw herself bravely in front of her rabbi, giving her life to protect his. Another worshipers chased the gunman into the street, and an eight-year-old girl who escaped Hamas rockets in Israel is shot in the leg. Shocking news from our nation's largest state. Jenna Browder has this. President Trump called Rabbi Yisrael Goldstein to offer his condolences. At a vigil Sunday night, the rabbi said he was touched by the president's words. He then went on to describe the attack and the heroism of some of his congregants. It's unfathomable where I faced death face to face. The rabbi, who was injured himself, describes the moment the accused shooter opened fire. I see the shooter standing there in position with the rifle, moving it towards me. He says it was a miracle the shooter's gun jammed and credits members of the congregation for risking their lives to stop the attack. Gushing blood and stuff. And he was like screaming my dad's name. The youngest victim, eight-year-old Noya Duhon, 60-year-old Lori Kay died. Friends say she stepped in front of the rabbi to stop the gunman. He dropped his weapon and he ran out and I chased him out of the, out of the sanctuary. Witnesses say 19-year-old John T. Ernest was chased out of the synagogue by two worshipers, including an off-duty border patrol agent who opened fire as he drove away, police arresting him about a mile away. Earlier, in a letter posted online under his name, he says he wanted to kill Jews and praise the gunmen accused in both the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting and recent mosque attacks in New Zealand. Police say Ernest is also being investigated in connection to an arson attack at a California mosque. We forcefully condemn the evil of anti-Semitism and hate which must be defeated. And I think there's something particularly onerous about being gone down in your place of worship. This says anti-Semitism is on the rise in America and worldwide. Just this weekend, the World Jewish Congress calling out the New York Times for publishing a cartoon in its international edition, showing Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu leading a blind President Trump. Tweeting, the New York Times has crossed a red line today by publishing a cartoon infused with anti-Semitic tropes. The New York Times issued an apology. Michael Rydelnik, whose parents survived the Holocaust, is an expert on anti-Semitism at the Moody Bible Institute. It's like a, a contagious disease that's always under the surface, and sometimes it spurs up into to epidemic proportions, and then sometimes it recedes. For young Noya, whose family recently moved from southern Israel, where her village was subject to rocket attacks from Gaza, and saw her home in California vandalized with anti-Semitic graffiti. I don't really feel safe. And the rabbi with this message. Terrorism will not win, but peace and love will. Ernest has been charged with murder and will likely face federal hate crime charges as well. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. 
Benjamin Disraeli was the prime minister of Israel, I mean of England, under Queen Victoria. And uh, she, the queen asked him, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, what uh, evidence uh, can you give us of the existence of God? And his answer was, the Jew, your majesty, because this is the race that has been the witness to the power of the God of the Bible. And we study the Bible. We study the Old Testament, New Testament. These are Jewish books. And why is there anti-Semitism? Because there's a Satan who hates God and he hates God's people. And he knows that the evidence of the existence of God flows in large part from his prophets who had his sacred book, the Jewish people. So I condemn anti-Semitism and recognize its source. And we have stood with Israel for years and years. We have been defenders. We've been helpful and we'll continue to do so. And we'll raise our voice against these senseless attacks and the, the hatred that is inspired by Satan himself. Well, back to the news. The one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the United States is called the National Rifle Association, the NRA. And uh, my good friend, Ali North, has just uh, resigned as president of the NRA after an internal feud with the CEO. John Jessup has more on that. That is right, Pat. Oliver North told the NRA board in a letter that he won't be renominated president, this after a dispute with longtime CEO Wayne LaPierre. In his own letter to the board, LaPierre claimed North tried to pressure him into resigning, writing, quote, the exhortation was simple, resign or there will be destructive allegations made against me and the NRA. North had previously sent a letter to the board's executive committee raising questions about LaPierre's handling of finances and sought to form a crisis committee to investigate. Well, a new study confirms obesity increases the risk of disease and early death. The study looked at 2.8 million adults in the UK over a period of 18 years. It found obese people are more likely to have heart disease, diabetes, heart, uh, high blood pressure, and irregular heartbeat. Obesity is defined as body mass of 30 or more, which means being 30 pounds or more overweight. The study found people with a body mass index of 30 to 35 have a 70% higher risk of heart failure and are five times more likely to get type 2 di diabetes. The study also found the more overweight a person is, the higher the likelihood of disease. And Pat, the study's author also noted that the worldwide obesity rate has more than tripled in the last 30 years. Well, I have looked at the cause and we have studied it together. And I think that the culprit is what's called high fructose corn syrup. But let's go to our CBN News Medical Report. Laurie Johnson is with us. Laurie, uh, talk to us about, you know, we, we've studied together uh, the whole idea of inflammation. And what is causing this epidemic of obesity? People are just, they're, they're not just a little overweight, they're, they're morbidly obese. That's right, and I think you hit the nail on the head, Pat. It's high fructose corn syrup, or in a broader sense, it's two things, sugar and processed food, which are basically the same thing because we know that processed food often turns to sugar. And one of the worst ingredients in processed food is high fructose corn syrup. This stuff from a food manufacturer's point of view is a dream come true. But from a health perspective, it is our worst nightmare. High fructose corn syrup is like sugar on steroids. It is so much cheaper than than sugar. It is so much more easily added to everything in our grocery stores, and it is highly, highly addictive. So we need to get off of this stuff, Pat. Well, I, I, I totally agree. How, how do people get free of it, though? It's in everything. I love that. That's a great question. In <laughs> fact, I interviewed a physician in New York St City, Dr. Vincent Pedre, and the story is on our website, CBN.com, and he helps people break their sugar addiction. You know that they did studies on mice, and the mice preferred sugar 
to cocaine. That's how addictive it is. It gets in your brain and the dopamine receptors, receptors and the pleasure centers. But just like other drugs, you have to go through a withdrawal period where you really want it for a certain period of time. But the good news is after three or four days, a week, two, three weeks tops, you stop craving it so much. And we need to replace the sugar and the processed food with fiber because fiber is so essential for our gut microbiome and the sugar destroys our gut microbiome. Our gut microbiome controls all of our health functions, including our brain. You know, we talk about diabetes that doubles your chance for Alzheimer's. Well, you know, Laurie, I know little children uh, have very sensitive palates and they don't need a lot of extra salt and they certainly don't need a lot of extra sugar, but they're their parents don't understand that. And so we have, you know, it's incredible how much sugar is being fed to little kids. I mean, the cereal industry oh. is just loaded with sugar. That's true. The, the, those cereals are the worst. And we, you know, let's face it, sugar, like so many other addictive drugs, makes us happy going down. And parents want to make their kids happy. But, uh, and we like to be happy. It, it does give you that temporary high, but in the long run, it hurts us. And parents need to be aware of this. Well, Lori, I appreciate what you're doing. God bless you. We enjoy your insights always. And, my, my pleasure. Uh, you, you know, I'm pleased to report I've lost, I've lost 50 pounds. I, I, I wear a whole lot less than I did when I was 15 years old. When I, when I was boxing, I was boxed heavyweight at 185 pounds, and I'm, I'm down considerably below that now. Yeah, you keep having to have your jackets in. Oh, take yeah, it they, in. They, they've <laughs> cut them down like crazy. But, you know, the secret, very frankly, is don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you some diet, just, but you know, uh, protein, fiber, what Gloria was saying is protein, fiber, and stay off of that sweet stuff. I mean, it is a craving, it is an addiction, and uh, you know, you, you can be free. It, 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 like every, a habit, folks, just take 21 days and you can establish a good habit or you can establish a bad habit. 21 days. You know what I had for dinner last night? Seared venison. Seared venison? That my husband shot. A deer? Yes. Bambi is no longer in the woods because you... <laughs> but it's the best. It's the leanest, most tasty oh, meat. Oh, yeah. If you don't overcook it. Yeah. Had it with that with a salad and so, and a few tater tots. But anyway, uh, you've got to have, you've got to venison. have a Venison. Well, not everybody can get venison, but it, yeah, I, wildlife, of course, is obviously... But here again, they... they they give antibiotics to chickens on a regular basis. So we've got antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. And then in terms of beef, they're fed hormones in order to make them fat and grow. And so when you eat a lot of that beef, you're, you're getting hormones which make you fat. And uh, it's in the milk, it's in all, oh, well. But folks, you can come free and that's the big thing. Wendy. All right, coming up, a teen's parents rushed to the hospital only to be given dire news. Their son is on life support and his brain has been decapitated from his body. Every time a doctor would tell us something what they knew, professionally knew, my wife and I would look at each other and say, no matter what they just told us, let's trust God. See how their faith set the stage for an undeniable miracle when we come back. Up next, the true story of America's first settlers. We could say they were missionaries. And how they sealed our destiny. They were going to America to live out a new kind of Christianity where people govern themselves. April 29th, 1607, after a 144-day voyage, a brave team of settlers landed at a place now called Cape Henry, which is part of this city of Virginia Beach where we are originate this program. And shortly after arriving, they planted a wooden cross on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, and they claimed this land, quote, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's look back at that historic day and see why it's so important to all of us today. 
April 29, 1607, a nation was born. Travel-weary Englishmen landed at Cape Henry on the shores of Virginia and lay the foundation for what would become the most powerful country the world has ever seen. Act one, scene one of the drama that was to be the United States unfolded that day at Cape Henry and sparked the legacy of godliness on American shores. Almighty God, by your great mercy, we have reached this land, which we now claim and establish for thy eternal purposes. We ask thee to open hearts and enlighten the understanding of the peoples of these shores to comprehend the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. America's destiny and purpose were sealed with that cross at Cape Henry. All that would follow in our nation's growth hinged on the single proclamation that this land belonged to Jesus Christ. In the Mayflower Compact of 1620, the pilgrims reaffirmed the mission set forth by the original Virginia settlers. They said, we have come here, first of all, for the glory of God, secondly, for the advancement of the Christian faith. We could say they were missionaries. They weren't just running from something. <laughs> there was a vision pulling them forward to advance the Christian faith in this new world. Later, the Puritans carried the Cape Henry legacy further. On the deck of the Arbella, halfway between England and Cape Cod, leader John Winthrop declared, we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. They were going to America to live out a new kind of government and Christianity where people govern themselves. They don't depend on an outward government. They would depend primarily on governing themselves according to Christian principles. We ask now that your kingdom come to earth and your will be done as it is in heaven. And to that end, we claim this land for that great purpose. Amen. Amen. More than a hundred years later, as America set off on her own course towards independence, the godly foundations laid in Virginia established the character of our revolution. John Adams boldly proclaimed, Before God, I believe the hour has come. My judgment approves this measure, and my whole heart is in it. All that I have, all that I am, and all that I hope in this life, I am now ready to stake upon it. And I leave off as I began, that live or die, survive or perish, I am for the declaration. It is my living sentiment, and by the blessing of God, it shall be my dying sentiment. Independence now, and independence forever. George Washington's pure Christian heart, Benjamin Franklin's call to prayer, and John Adams' reverence for the will of God symbolized the undying commitment of our founding fathers to the creation of a nation which would glorify God. The American character was born in Scripture and nurtured by the Holy Spirit. Yet today, our national heritage is under siege. The moment that religion, the pure undefiled religion, loses its influence over our hearts, from that fatal moment, farewell to public and private happiness, farewell, a long farewell, to virtue, to patriotism, to liberty, Bishop James Madison, 1795. More than 400 years have passed since America was first conceived at Cape Henry, and respect for our roots is growing cold. Yet one undeniable fact still remains. At its core, the United States of America is a Christian nation. We're here, ladies and gentlemen, in front of a cross, and I want to tell you a little bit about the story. A few years ago, we wanted to commemorate this day, and we went out to the shore of Virginia Beach where those settlers landed, and we reenacted uh, the landing uh, that they came ashore at Cape Henry. And I had uh, a group of, uh, of names of people that were to be put in this cross that's behind me. And I touched that cross and began to pray. 
And the anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon me as strongly as I've ever had in my entire life. It was an extraordinary experience. And I realized that somehow there was a transference of power from the early settlers, the beginning of this country, here to CBN, that we would carry on that tradition that was there. And so I'm here by that very same cross I'm telling you about, where we put those names in the microfiche, and we're here to celebrate the special day, April the 29th, 1607, when this country was founded. And God still wants you to know, and every one of us to know, that this country was indeed founded as a Christian country, and this land was dedicated to Jesus Christ. Now, the devil has done everything he can to take it away from us. And we're fast losing our liberty and uh, the, the things that have made us great. But as some of those people said, if we lose our virtue, uh, farewell to liberty. And George Washington said in his second inaugural address something that's so profound, reason and experience forbid us to expect public morality in the absence of religious principle. And when I think what the ACLU has done, when I think what successive Supreme Court decisions have done to strip the religion from our, our, our nation, it is simply appalling. But we're here to bear witness to the fact that God Almighty is on the throne and that this land, whatever people say, was originally dedicated to him and we want to reclaim that heritage. So Wendy and I are here and we want to pray and Wendy, I'll join hands with you. And you, you got something to you want to pray? Well, I just want to add that yes, you ma'am. were, you're related to one of those first settlers. Well, that's right. Settlers. The, the, well, I, I'm in the Jamestown. My, my uh, ancestors were there at the Jamestown com- Company, and and it's some thought that Robert Hunt, who was their chaplain, may well have been in my uh, ancestry. So I, I go back to those early days uh, in in a number of ways. Uh, spiritually as well as uh, physically. And when you first came down to found CBN, you didn't know that they had originally said from these shores, the no. gospel will go forth. And no. then it all sort of made sense why you came to Virginia Beach. It did. I, I was in Portsmouth and, and came over here and this piece of land was available and the Lord showed me and and spoke to me about this land that we should claim it for his glory. and. And uh, here we are in this beautiful setting, and it's the lovely campus of Regent University and CBN. So we're going to pray right now, and we're going to mention once again, on April the 29th, 1607, Act One, Scene One of the unfolding drama that became the United States of America. Now, Wendy and I are going to join hands. We're going to believe God. Father, thank you for the heritage we have as Christians, Thank you for this great land, this land of freedom and liberty and opportunity. We pray for America, Lord. We pray that we might reclaim the original spirit of God that permeated this early settlement. And Lord, we come back to the day when those settlers knelt in prayer around a cross in Cape Henry, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and claim this land for God. And we once again reassert the claim of Almighty God upon this nation, regardless of how the enemy would want to take it away from you, Lord. We give it to you. We as your servants, we come before you and we speak the word that says this land was dedicated to Jesus Christ. And once again, on April the 29th, we reaffirm the authority of the Lord Jesus over the United States of America. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. Wow, awesome. (laughs) I I just love that what happened on these shores and that we're able to rededicate it every year. It's so special. The Lord will hear that prayer. He sure will. Well, typically, in other news, typically they don't let visitors into the trauma center. In Aaron Williams' case, the nurses made an exception, but only because they didn't think he was going to make it. That's how 200 people were able to fill Aaron's room with prayer. And what happened after that has been described by doctors as a no doubt miracle. I just knew life had stopped for us. 
And I remember looking out the UK window and there was a football game and people were going. And I said, these people's lives are just going on. They're laughing and talking. And we're in this room and our lives have stopped. It was homecoming weekend for Bath County High School in Kentucky. On the way to the dance, 16-year-old Aaron Williams lost control of his car and slammed into a tree. Aaron sustained massive head trauma and was unconscious as the car burst into flames. Brock Baber drove by the scene just moments after the accident. There was a, a man carrying what looked, to, what looked to be a body and he was bringing it up towards his tailgate of his truck. It was very traumatic. Uh, they were just kind of in shock and at a loss of what to do. And something just came over me and said, guys, I'm gonna pray. Brock's prayer was the first of thousands for Aaron. Homecoming was canceled and students gathered at a local church to pray. His parents, Chris and Veronica, rushed to the UK hospital, uncertain of Aaron's condition. I couldn't get there fast enough. I, I needed to see him, I needed to see what he looked like, I needed to, I needed to be there. I stopped at that curb, kneeled down, and asked God to save my son. Aaron was in a coma with traumatic brain injury and on life support. A doctor told Chris the prognosis. And he said, your son won't live through the night. He had a disfusion, accidental brain injury. In layman's terms, they told me, his brain has been decapitated from his body and all the neurons are just spinning in his head. According to the doctor, 90% of people with his injury do not survive. The remaining 10% live with permanent mental or physical disabilities. Over the next few days, classmates and the community came to pray for Aaron in the trauma unit. You can't go back there unless the nurses light you. But they let all 200 people come in and see him. And then we asked her at one time, why? And she said, because they don't expect him to make it. He clung to life as prayer gatherings and encouraging emails came in from around the world. Chris and Veronica put their faith in God for a miracle, despite the prognosis. Every time a doctor would tell us something what they knew, professionally knew, my wife and I would look at each other and say, let's trust God. Let's just keep trusting God. No matter what they just told us, let's trust God. Five days after the accident, Chris and Veronica feared they would be asked to remove Aaron from life support. That night, Veronica says she fought for Aaron's life in prayer. I laid, I opened up the Bible, I read those scriptures, I prayed. I read out of the Bible and I prayed and I went all the way around his bed. And I did this for two solid hours and I knew at that moment, I knew God was in control. Everything that was happening, God was in it and I knew it was gonna be okay, I knew it. 12 hours later, Aaron suddenly showed signs of brain activity. They would pinch him, they would take his skin and they would pinch him and they would scream in his ear, trying to get any kind of movement, any kind of response, there was nothing. She grabbed that broken collarbone and pressed on it as hard as she could press. She said, Aaron, you've been in a car wreck. I need for you to give me a thumbs up. And just in the nick of time, that day, nothing before, but Aaron gave a thumbs up. He was transferred to a rehab hospital, but remained in a vegetative state coma. Then 43 days after the accident, a friend noticed something different about Aaron. He said, he's trying to talk to us. And I said, what do you mean? He said, he's trying to tell us something. He said, do you have an iPad? So we opened it up and got it started and they put it in his hands and he instantly, he opened it up on the notes and started texting, what's wrong with me? How long have I been here? Why can't I talk? Why can't I walk? He had so many questions. It went on for an hour. And that day was wonderful. Because that was the day we knew he was there. Against all odds, Aaron was back. He had to learn to speak and walk again, but was soon fully functional and thankful for the prayers that sustained him. Whenever I first woke up, I thought it was just a regular car wreck, regular old car wreck. I wasn't, I didn't know all the details yet. So I was like, isn't there a lot of people that get in car wrecks and they don't have prayer groups like this? And I was just amazed. I'm thankful to have all everybody around me 
that it supports me, helps me through everything that I go through. I believe and pay tribute to an almighty God who heard the prayers of thousands of people. There is power in prayer. What the doctors have told us, what he has come through, you have to believe that it's a miracle. There's no doubt. Aaron returned to school and graduated in 2018. He's attending college in Kentucky and pursuing an engineering degree. Chris and Veronica are thankful for all the prayers and the presence of God when they needed him most. When you have a crisis in your life, you need him. And you've got to be ready, you've got to be prayed up, because if I wasn't, I, I wouldn't have been in the situation where I could have done that for my son. I couldn't have prayed for him. And I know that's the only thing that has helped him. Aaron is, is, is proof in God and hope. Even though I was told there was no hope, there's always hope of Jesus. Always hope of Jesus. Always hope with Jesus. Well, we are just beginning our week of prayer here at CBN, and we want to make sure that we lift up your needs. If you're a CBN partner, you should have received this uh, booklet in the mail. With it, there's an insert where you can write down your request. Send that back to us, and a member of our staff will pray for you. If you haven't received this mailing, give us a call. Our number is 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to CBN.com, and we will send you scriptures of faith, hope and love. Lastly, we want you to pray alongside us. We have a wonderful week, a lineup, lineup of dynamic speakers in our chapel services. You can stream those on CBN.com every day at noon Eastern. Today's guest is Kyle Eidelman. We'll be, we'll be hearing from him a little later on the program, and you don't want to miss that, Pat. Amen. Well, we have surrounded with us now thousands of prayer requests. People have written in their needs and the Lord knows your heart, and He knows the need. And here's some that we have uh, just mentioned specifically. Somebody says, I need healing of colon, liver, and lung cancer. Sounds very uh, serious, but God is able. Asking for financial blessings so my son doesn't lose his business. And here is the thing, that America would turn to God and stop spreading hatred. Amen. Okay, here's one, Pat. Um, that my granddaughter be healed from the trauma of being robbed at gunpoint. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I need to be healed of COPD. Very difficult to breathe. Doctor says I won't be alive for long. Well, with God, all things are possible. And that my wife and I be reconciled, not divorced. Amen. Folks, what we've got here, if you show me the camera, uh, I mean the picture, we've got thousands of prayer requests that have come to us already as you have filled out your needs and the Lord saw and heard as you were putting those needs together and we're going to pray for you. So Wendy and I will join hands. We're going to agree with you. Now what I'm asking you to do at home, agree with us as we pray and receive what God wants to give you. Don't turn it down. Say, yes, Lord, I take it. We join hands. Father, I join hands with Wendy. And we do what you said. If two of you would agree on earth as touching anything, it will be done for them by my Father, which is in heaven. Now, we agree right now, Lord. Yes. May the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. And right now, liver cancer is being healed. I know that is an impossible thing, but God does the impossible. There's going to be fire going into that liver, and you're going to be completely healed. You won't need a liver transplant. You're going to be completely healed in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yes. Marriages are being restored. Those who've been in that desperate place crying out for their spouse, God is doing a miracle. Don't give up in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, someone, uh, you had a uh, an injury to your throat, to your esophagus. It's very sore. God is healing that. You're going to be okay. Thank something, you. if the name is right, is Miriam. Uh, uh, there's something called pulmonary fibrosis. I, I don't even know what, the, what all that is, but whatever it is, you're being healed of it. Receive an answer in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Wendy. What else do you have? Someone with, um, it's your right eye, and um, it's just inflamed. It's swollen. It's been very painful for a long time. The doctors haven't 
known what to do. God is touching you right now. Your eye is being restored in Jesus' name. Just receive it. Well, Father, we hold before you these hundreds, maybe thousands of, of requests that we've received. We hold them before you, Lord. You know the hurts of people. You know the suffering of people. You know the heart cry of people. And they're crying out to you, Lord, for an answer. And we hold them before you, and we ask that you might do a miracle, that Jesus Christ might be honored. Touch now, Lord, these people in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Give us a call, by the way, if you have received an answer. And if you need prayer on the phones right now, it's 1 800 700 7000. Godly counselors on the phone at this moment to pray with you. And uh, others who got these re request forms, fill them out, send them in. Uh, there's no financial obligation. We just, you know, here to pray for you. Wendy? Well, Stella Head, he's pastor of one of the 10 largest churches in America, and he's going to share the three words that people need to hear most. Kyle Eidelman tells us don't give up. Next. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Attorney General William Barr might not testify before Congress this week after all. The Justice Department warning he may forego a scheduled hearing Thursday to review special counsel Robert Mueller's report. DOJ has balked at the panel's plans to allow the committee lawyers to question Barr for 30 more minutes after the usual lawmakers questioning. Well, CBN's Orphan's Promise is running weekly kids clubs in Spain. The clubs provide a safe and hopeful space for at-risk children and their families, many of whom are refugees or trafficking victims. Partnering with the International Church of Madrid to run weekly kids clubs, hundreds of kids are met with smiling faces, warm hugs, and the message of God's love from this Orphan's Promise program. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com international. Pat and Wendy will be back right after this. Well, the clock was ticking down, the kids were exhausted, but there was a youth basketball championship on the line. Coach Kyle Eidel Eidelman was on the sidelines with a dozen struggling preteens. That's when another coach delivered a speech the players needed to hear, and one we need to hear as well. Don't give up. That's like the exit ramp to quit. Kyle Eidelman is the senior pastor of one of the 10 largest churches in America. Each week, he speaks to more than 25,000 people. Over the years, he's discovered that in the midst of life's challenges and obstacles, the message most people need to hear consists of three simple words. Don't give up. Kyle shares in his book, Don't Give Up, how the Bible speaks courage and confidence to us when we need it most, and uses life stories where others got back up and kept fighting, even when life got tough. Kyle Eidelman is here with us now, and welcome to the 700 Club. Yeah. Is this your first time here? It is. Great to well, be with you. Yes. Well, first thing first, we have to find out, did your son's team win the game? They did win the game, yeah. So it was an exciting game. And the, the takeaway from that, as I applied it to the book, was that, you know, those guys, those boys, they wanted to sit on the bench, get something to drink. They had worked and worked and worked. They were having muscle cramps and were tired. and. Yeah. But that wasn't the right time, right? The, it, the time was to step in, to give it all that you, you had, leave it all on the court. And um, the idea is that oftentimes when we're struggling and we're going through something difficult, we want people to tell us, hey, great job, have a seat, here's some water. <laughs> yeah. What we need oftentimes is someone to tell us, no, no, get back in there. This is the time to fight. This is the time to lean in. You say there's two ways to give that message, the don't give up message. There's the William Wallace Braveheart way <laughs> uh, where you go in with your sword. And then there's the Mr. Rogers <clears throat> in the nice sweater and the calm voice way to give that message. When do you know the difference? How do you know when to deliver which message? Well, you know, I've discovered that if you have some support in your life with family and friends, they tend to be Mr. Rogers. They tend to put their arm around you and comfort you and tell you, hey, it's gonna be okay. Um, if you don't have that, then oftentimes 
the church needs to be that for you. Uh, but if, if you have it, then you probably need someone more like William Wallace, maybe, <laughs> you know, without the blue face paint, but you need somebody to challenge you, even if that's not what you want, instead of just putting an arm around your shoulder to have somebody kind of grab you by the shoulders and say, hey, there's a lot on the line right now. So, so you need to fight for this. Uh, I, an easy application of that would be in a marriage. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very easy to surround yourself. If you're going through a difficult season in marriage, surround yourself with people who um, will kind of reinforce the fact that, well, that's not fair and he or yes. she shouldn't treat you that way. And, sure. And, and sometimes that comfort is important, but boy, there are seasons where we need people to say, hey, it's not easy. You need to fight. But you need to fight. Yeah. yeah. Wow. How do we avoid that victim mentality that is easy to get into? Like you know, it's, you know, I'm being abused or whatever. Yeah, it is easy to get into. And um, I, I think shifting perspective goes a long way. So when I start to feel sorry for myself, and I do that sometimes, um, I will spend time intentionally with some people that model joy and model peace in situations that are much more difficult than my own. In the book, I talk about spending eight weeks in Haiti with uh, a pastor named Idri. And as I am with him, you know, I begin to recognize that some of the things that feel overwhelming to me, some challenges that feel so difficult, are really blessings. And I just, I just need to look at things from a different perspective. Okay. So how do, how do people break out of the victim mentality? You touched on that, but can you elaborate? Yeah. So I, I think if we pray our way through it, it, it makes a big difference. And, and so there's a shift that I love to challenge people with in their prayers. If, if they pray as a victim, then they're going to finish their prayer feeling Uh, more overwhelmed and more like a victim. So God wants us to talk to him about our struggles. But at some point, we begin to talk to our struggles about God. We begin to to talk about his promises and his power Mm -hmm. and his strength. And when we do that, we're not a victim, not because we're strong enough, but because he's strong enough. So getting out of a victim mentality is not positive self-talk where we're trying to convince ourselves, hey, I've got what it takes. It's rooted in a faith. It's rooted in who God is, not in who we are. And you say in terms of staying strong, you reference Hebrews 11 and 12. What can we learn from those two chapters? Yeah, so, you know, we need a a scriptural foundation for the don't give up message. If it's it's just kind of a a trite, don't, yeah, pep talk, um, it gets exposed pretty quickly by life. And so Hebrews 11 and 12 is a great foundation where, Um, The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 12 says, you know, let us not grow weary in doing good and let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In due season. Yeah, yeah, in due season, we'll reap a harvest, Galatians 6 and 9, if we don't, if we don't give up. Um, And it says, let us run the race marked out for us. And and my race may be different than someone else's, but it's the race God has marked out for us. And, And so that kind of biblical truth allows the don't give up message to be not just wishful thinking, but to be rooted in scripture. Well, Pastor Kyle, you, I mean, you, this must be not just uh, the title of your book, The Don't Give Up, but you're one of the uh, youngest pastors I've seen that in one of the largest churches in America, the top 10 largest churches in America. I mean, this had to be personal for you to get where you are today to pastor to so many people every weekend. Yes, and in fact, the the book really came out of being a pastor. And, you know, just listening to y'all earlier in the show, pray for so many people. I just resonate with that as a pastor. I'm always praying for people and just recognizing that the common struggle is persevering. They just need that encouragement, that challenge in their lives to to not give up. And so as, as a pastor, you see enough of those stories, you know, that when I'm writing this book, it's not just theoretical. I mean, there are names and there are faces that are, you know, on my mind and in my heart because I know how much that's needed. Well, it personally encouraged me. I, I, I wasn't even like in hardly into page one and it was like, wow. I mean, everybody needs to hear this, what you have to say, and we need to hear it every single day. Thank you for writing this. Thank you. 
Well, you can learn more from Kyle by getting his new book, Don't Give Up, Faith That Gives You the Confidence to Keep Believing and the Courage to Keep Going. It's available in stores nationwide. And once again, Kyle is going to be our featured guest in our chapel service this afternoon. You can watch it online by going to cbn.com at noon Eastern. You don't want to miss that. Well, still to come, another round of your questions, honest answers. One viewer asks, is the second coming the same as the rapture? Pat weighs in on that and much more, so don't go away. It was an interesting interview you had. I, I loved it. Don't give up. I love that message because I think we really actually need to hear it every day. Can, can I tell a little story? Please you know, do. I, I've had a lot of experience over the years, but when I was in seminary, I, I, I had a youth group. Uh, I was assistant pastor in a, a church in the Bayside, uh, New York area. And uh, I was having trouble with this youth group. And uh, I was thinking, man, this is really hard. <laughs> and I, I was praying, and the Lord led me to a scripture that was so clear. He said, if, if you've run with men and they've wearied you, how will you contend with horses? And <laughs> These were little kids. <laughs> they were little kids. That's right. Well, they weren't. They were teenagers. Oh, they were teenagers. Anyhow, well, those, uh, that could be hard. How will you contend with horses? And uh, what the problems I have now are so much greater than anything like that. And the Lord was saying, look, I've got a long way for you to go, and there are a whole lot more challenges. And A, don't give up. That's a good word. All right, let's Amen. get to Yeah, let's get to some great questions here. This viewer says, I was wondering if the second coming is the same thing as the rapture. Great question. Uh, the word rapture is from the Latin rapio, which means I snatch. It had to do with us going up in the air. Now, in my view of eschatology, the second coming will take place. The Lord will descend with the angels, and the dead in Christ will rise, and those who are, are, remain in our life will be caught up to be with him in the air. So the second coming will coincide with the rapture. I don't go along with that stuff about a seven-year rapture and then a whole lot of being, people being left behind and, and uh, airplanes leaving in the pilot's uh, uniform on the seat and the guy going up to heaven and the plane crashes. It just isn't going to happen. I mean, it makes it's, a great movie, though. Well, he does. <laughs> I mean, uh, Tim he got a lot of money for that. Uh, he had a whole series, and it was very popular. But uh, it isn't scriptural. So is it the same thing? When the Lord comes back, he's going to take control of the earth. And yes, we will rise up to be with him at the air. It'll all coincide. All right. The second coming. All right. This viewer says, I have a mental illness as well as a speech problem. I can get very agitated at times as well as quick to anger. The good news is I try to stay in my room until those feelings go away because I don't like to yell or rant at others, especially if it's my own problematic situation. And I do feel bad if it happens. I know in scripture it says something about being quick to anger and other negative emotions. My question is, am I at fault for all of this? Um, I, I think you, you need to talk to a, a neurologist or a specialist. Uh, you, you obviously have a, an emotional uh, neurological condition uh, that needs help. And are you going to be charged for doing that? I don't think so. I mean, God's not going to hold you accountable if you've got a, a mental disease that's causing you to blow off the handle and get nervous. But uh, there are hormones. There is diet. There are all kinds of things that you need. And, you know, there are people who are so-called endocrinologists who can check on your blood sugar level and other things to see what is causing this emotional problem. All right? Amen. Lena says, what's the meaning of 1 Timothy 5.8? King James says, if not, it says, if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Does this mean if the husband or man does not change his ways that he will not make it into heaven <laughs> because he is considered worse than an unbeliever? I, you know, I, I think we're always pushing those things and we're drawing conclusions and then we're spending them beyond. I don't think he's, Paul's talking about the man's eternal salvation. What he's saying is, if you won't look after your own, he is regarded as if he were an infidel. But I, I don't think Paul was telling he's going to hell because he doesn't uh, pay the bills for his wife. I, I don't think that's what is, is meant by that. But it is something that you should consider. And it certainly is something that is wrong. If, if a Christian man 
does not look after his wife and his children, he's doing a terrible thing. And, and as Paul said, he's worse than an infidel, period. Okay. All right. Gloria says, I have been suffering from severe depression, anxiety, and constant dizziness. I have to quit my job. Is this God's will for me? Why can't I get cured? I've done everything I can. Prayers, asking God for help. Things seem to be getting worse. What can I do? Uh, I think I've got the same answer as before. Uh, you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We've done a thing about gut flora. If you've got the wrong flora in your gut, uh, you can be emotionally unstable. You can have all kinds of chronic diseases that are caused by the second brain. Uh, you can have a neurological injury. You can have all kinds of things going on in your life. The Lord will heal you, but at the same time, don't forsake wisdom. But we leave you with today's Power Minute from 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. But this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Well, that's all the time we've got. And so for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thanks for being with you. And we'll see you again tomorrow. God bless you.